Hi, this is Dr. Jeremy Schmel, and this is a part of our Technologies and Traumatic Brain Injury mini-series. Today, I'm here with Dr. Ted Carrick, and we're going to be having a conversation about the use of a technology called Brain EQ and how important it is to get objective measures of uh, post-concussion symptoms and be able to track people when they go home. So I'm going to let him kind of, you know, give the the basics of what brain EQ is, and then I'll jump in and ask some questions, and we'll go from there. So okay, sounds, sounds good to me. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, brain EQ. I'm not involved with brain EQ, so it's not mine, but I use it, and I am a non-paid member of the medical advisory board. These people gathered. Uh, all of the people that are fairly prominent in the concussion world to get insights onto different things and developed some pretty impressive activity that helps people help themselves and helps doctors help them. So let's just backtrack a little bit and I can tell you uh, about, you know, why uh, brain EQ, what it means and why it's important for all of us to utilize it. Brain EQ came out of uh, Toronto uh, from a group of physicians who are experts in brain injury and emergency medicine. And what is uh, the unfortunate reality is that doctors don't really have any good tests that's going to tell you if you've hurt yourself. In other words, you, you're playing hockey or football or maybe you slip on the floor and you hit your head and you feel a little woozy or so or maybe sick to your stomach or you know, whatever. And basically all of the tests don't show doctors very much. Mm -hmm. So you can have a scan of your head, you can have an x-ray or a CT scan or an MRI. And basically the word is, well, you know, that looks pretty good. So that's, a, that's the good news because yeah. you haven't done anything seriously. But the bad news is, is that you can't stand going out in the light. You can't stand the sound. You can't think so well but it's probably going to get better. So this plagued people and for over the last, you know, couple of decades, many people have developed some very good instruments to measure uh, the consequence of brain activity. And largely these were neuro uh, psychological instruments or neurophysiological instruments, which are basically uh, pen and paper that, someone would ask you a question, you give an answer in, or there would be different aspects where we would give you a set of numbers and you'd repeat them or uh, scenarios and all of these things. And they would give us very good information so that even though uh, the test didn't show that you had some structural damage, you certainly had functional damage. And what did that mean? Well, it meant something if you had those tests before you hurt your head and then you could use that as a baseline and then that baseline uh, could be compared to something else. So th there's a variety of these tests that are around and are available. The other things that developed in concussion research is the reality that if your brain is hurt, your balance suffers and your gait suffers. So there has been great advances in measuring balance. How do we stand? How do we walk? Uh, and there's different tests that have been validated that everyone uses that uh, patients can use themselves. And, and if you've hurt your head or if, if you've been to a doctor for anything, usually they'll have you standing and then standing and closing your eyes or standing on one leg. And there's different formulas that are used for this type of activity. Now, what happens is, is that these doctors in Toronto uh, realize that all these testings are, are really, really good, but the reality is, is that they're usually done in the doctor's office. And this is a little bit of a problem because people don't usually have their major problems in the office. They have it when the kids come home and it's loud or it's noisy or the TV is on, or the cars are honking, or they've got to drive, or they've got a task, or do a variety of things. So it was, it was known at this time, wouldn't it be great if there were some diagnostics that could be done in the workplace, in the home, in the car, uh, wherever you are at whatever time that you might have a symptom, 
that could give validated uh, information to doctors. And everyone agreed with that. The problem that was identified is that people don't do their tests. It's like, okay, we're going to brush our teeth in the morning and the evening time. Most adults do this. You'd be surprised some people don't. But a lot of people do. And if you've had kids, you know how difficult it is. Okay, come on, brush your teeth, you know, one, two, no, get back in there. And now well, we've got a pandemic, unfortunately, and people have got to, you know, wash their hands and do their ABC links. And you look at people, people that you know, uh, and they'll come in and it's like, you know, a, a five second deal. So people don't do the things that doctors recommend. Uh, unless they really are into a position that they've got to do it. Well, with brain activity, if you injure your brain, you may or may not get symptoms. Some people that have severe brain injuries don't know there's anything wrong, but their personalities may change. All of a sudden, everybody in the world is a jerk. Uh, the boss is a jerk. They don't like their spouse. They don't like other people. Everyone's wrong. And if everyone you meet is a jerk, it's, prob it's probably you. And uh, these are things that, that are associated with head injuries and, and other sorts of things. So the one thing that is known is that people will do things that are pleasurable uh, for them and sometimes to excess. And this is a problem with drugs and alcohol or things that are, uh, can be pleasurable uh, to people, can be addicting. But there are some things that are pleasurable uh, and addicting that don't seem to hurt so much. Uh, gambling, for instance, can be pleasurable and addicting, but it can hurt you because you can lose you know, everything you have uh, gambling. But other uh, games such as cribbage or scrabble or chess uh, can be equally addicting and equal grat equally gratifying. So what has been found with research is that people, especially younger people, uh, like to play video games. They love it. And if you've ever seen a kid and they've got like, you know, uh, Candy Crisp or Candy Crunch or whatever the new name is coming out, they'll play for hours and, and sometimes become mesmerized to the point of time that parents are concerned they're doing too much, but they do it. And guess what happens to, to big kids? Well, we like to do it too. Anytime you can play a game, whether it be Pac-Man or something else. So uh, this team in Toronto said, look, it, we need to have diagnostics. We need to use validated instruments to give us good measurements so we know what's happening. We need to have all of the pen and pencil neuropsychological tests, but we need to have physical tests and uh, we need to have people want to do the test so that uh, we can have them do it whenever they're at home, but wouldn't it be great if they could do it every day of their life? And that that information could be given to us so that we could see patterns and that the patient could see them as well. Yeah. So what they did, uh, which I think is really genius, is they gamified uh, medical diagnostic tests. And what gamified means is they, they took tests that we all use and they made it fun. And when you make it fun, people will do it. Now, backtracking just a little bit, when you look at regular tests and people go into a doctor's office, what are they gonna get out of this test? Well, if you're a competitive athlete and you know this test is measuring your function and could be used to compare to an injury, you have a tendency to sandbag it, or you have a tendency to fake it, or you have a tendency to purposely score low so that if something happens to you uh, and you do the test earnestly and it's about the same as the test that you faked, no one knows that you can continue to play. We see this in professional athletes a lot. We see it in collegiate athletes, high school athletes. People want to play their, their games. When they're gamified, however, it's a different story because you're gonna get something out of it. And this game, EQ, Brain EQ, is a highly developed uh, neurological assessment that gives you a reward by playing it. And the reward is such that you get like coins and coupons and things like this. Let me tell you why this is good. All of us are not as smart as the person next door. And sometimes if you have a lot of smart people around you, 
you go like, man, I don't feel like I'm so, you know, so smart compared to these people. So it's hard to compete against them. Or if you're going to play tennis against somebody who's really good, what's the point? You're never going to improve. So the Brain EQ people realize this and they reward people by participation. So this is what it means. If you have a game and you score, say, 50 out of 100, it's depressing if everyone else is scoring 90. Yeah. But what this EQ does is it gamifies it so that your 50 is such, if you play it more, you're going to get more points because of the number of times that you played. And the feedback to you is that as you play more, you get more points and you improve your scores. You're really happy, even though your scores might not be, if you took away the game, as good as someone else. But the doctor will know your raw data. They will know the actual performance. So no one is stigmatized or embarrassed that they can't say a few numbers backwards or forwards. They can do a variety of things. So they popped out um, this game. And including in the game, they have everything in the toolbox that doctors, therapists, uh, trainers, coaches utilize regularly. And we have things that have been uh, approved for use by international consensus or meetings where people say, these are the things that work, these are the things that don't, let's use the things that work best and try to improve it. So we have like a SCAT test, which is a sideline uh, test, and it's on a CQ. So people can do it themselves. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, if your son or your daughter or a friend or someone you care for, even someone that you don't care for is involved in an event and they hit their head, you can do this test. But the beautiful thing is, let's say they're just running and they're playing soccer and they head the ball, they have no symptoms. We know that these are little minor sub-concussions that we say, a little bit under, but that they cause damage, that you can do these sideline tests and you can find if something is wrong. And the sideline tests are validated. They're great to have. They also have uh, Glasgow coma scores. They have other things uh, which are looking at measuring uh, how your eyes can move from a target to a target. And quite frankly, everyone is in agreement that the ability to measure this is better than the standardized test that we call um, you know, King David test or so. And it's right on the phone. The person does it themselves and the doctor gets the, the numbers and the validated activity. And then they have different games, which are just, I love doing them myself. They are addicting where we say that people, that uh, if your memory is okay, you should be able to remember seven numbers, like a telephone number, you should be able to remember it. Well, in the real world, there's not too many of us that haven't been given a number. And then when we dial it, somebody else answers. Yeah, and yeah. we probably, we should have written it down. Well, that's not a good thing. In my mind, if I can't remember seven numbers, it, it gets me going. But we also should be able to do those seven numbers backwards. Some people can, some people can't. There's different standards. So in this EQ game, which I think is genius, they have a coach. Like a, like a football coach. Yeah. And he sits there and he gives sets of numbers. Starts with two, then goes to three, builds up to seven. And he, and he does it without emotion. Like one, nine, five, 14, you know, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden you see uh, on, on your phone or your iPad, you see a football team. And they've got numbers on their jerseys. And you just tap the numbers in the order that the coach said if you get it right, the football player grunts and jumps off the bench and is ready to play. And if you don't get it right, well, different things happen. You don't get a shock or anything, but you know, it gets you to want to play. And then that, that information is said immediately. Your doctor can see that in live time. And I know myself, I, I see people um, from around the world in the work that I do. And these people are great. You know, they go, oh my gosh, you know, so-and-so has hurt their head. I wonder if there's okay. Take this EQ, boom, they do it. I can see it live time. I don't have to have them into my office and I can get a good idea 
of whether they've injured their head or not. It's very, very accurate. Then we've got different aspects where uh, a person will go shopping and they'll have a shopping cart and the person will say milk, cereal, butter, steak, hamburger, lettuce, whatever. And then they go through uh, on their phone, the shopping cart, and they'll have to pick out these items and they're going to find out if they can remember short-term, long-term memories, a variety of other things. They have a balance app, which is absolutely amazing. And we've done a lot of work with my team uh, using some very sophisticated balance measuring devices and published on it. But what these guys have done is really brilliant because they use an iPhone or an iPad and you hold it and that's got all of these things that's going to see how much you wobble. And then you'll do what we call the best test. And this best test is a standardized test that's going to say, you know, whether you've got an impairment in this balance. So what they did is you do this best test and they extrapolate it so that let's say you've got a little wobbling here or there, you really can't see it. But at the end of the test, they show you yeah. throwing a football through a tire. So if you're a wobbler thing, the football doesn't go through the tire. So you're going to try to do it better. It gives amazing, amazing activities on and on. So they've developed a tool that's enjoyable. People like to do it. And the biggest problem that we have in the treatment of concussions is that when people feel better, they tend not to do any exercises that they may have had before. They yeah. go back to their pre-concussion uh, uh, status and they may have a severe problem that can come out. We know, for instance, that individuals that have a concussion, that have symptoms, that after their symptoms go away, a year later, that they have decreased blood supply to the front of their brain. We know that. We have studies to show that. But what we don't have for most people is the ability to get them to do a test. Now, looking at it, quite frankly, uh, things cost money so that all of a sudden I've injured my head. I go to a doctor. They treat me great. I'm feeling good. My life is back in, in gear. And a year later, I'm feeling great. There's a good probability that I'm not going to want to cough up the money to go in to see this doctor because I feel great. This EQ app is marvelous because it's free. Uh, usually the doctors give the patient a link, they download the app, and they can do it as many times as they want, and it doesn't cost them anything. So when they're doing these things, it's going to tell them a variety of things because if their performance goes down, they're going to say, oh my God, you know, I'm not memory, remembering my numbers as well. They're going to call the doctor and say, hey, you know, I think I'm going to come in. But the beautiful thing is the doctor can see this as well. And so if everything's going good, they can say, hey, um, patient, uh, you did pretty well in this. I, uh, there's no need to come and see me. Or, you know, you've taken a dip. Let's get you in and let's, you know, address these things. Yeah. So the feedback's immediate to the person. Now, wh when we look at the reality of life, people feel great in the doctor's office. It's like, you know, your tooth is killing you. Go to the dentist, nothing hurts. It's like, well, it hurt here. And, well, I guess that's good. You go home, you wake up in the middle of the night, your tooth, you go like, what the heck? You know, what, what happened to me? So when it comes to brain, sometimes you don't know you forget until you're asked to remember. And it can be subtle things in the house. How does this work? As we get older, uh, we're, we're not going to remember things as well as when we were younger. So uh, conditions that we call neurodegenerative, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease, frontal temporal dementia, the super Parkinson's disorders, are all associated with uh, decreased abilities to, to do things as we all could do in our youth. This EQ is really just a marvelous, um, just a marvelous application because it's utilized for just general brain health. Uh, so I'm just really thrilled with it. I know that everyone that's in the, uh, the concussion uh, caring, uh, you know, society or concussion business, if you would, 
which everyone is if you're a citizen on the planet, is utilizing EQ. It's something that in most uh, clinics that specialize in concussion, they just give it to people. Uh, some people, they charge them for it for interpretation, but it's minor, if anything. And I do know for a fact that industry is utilizing it. For instance, uh, people uh, in areas where uh, marijuana is legalized, uh, such as in Canada, um, yeah. can be stoned at work. It's legal, but stoned at work doesn't mean good function. Yeah. So you can see whether people are able to function. You also can see with people that are driving heavy equipment. Before, we'd have little cards that would say, well, you, you know, after X number of hours on the road, you need to pull over and take a little bit of a, of a break. But now you can look and see what their function is. So the applications are just uh, phenomenal. The thing that I like uh, personally about EQ is that it is what we call in the United States HIPAA compliant or in other areas, it's uh, patient um, performance compliant. So no one is going to know what I do or score on that individual test except for my doctor. Uh, so that my data or my performance, no one knows. My neighbor's not going to know how well or how badly that I actually did. So it's, it's at that grade of medical security that is just perfect and protected and uh, validated. So patients are going to see this more and more, especially if they go to a specialty clinic, they definitely are going to be seeing it. So if, you, if you're uh, the average person and you go to your doctor and you hurt your head and they don't advise you to use this app, then maybe you're not in a place that really specializes in what you're doing because it's just so commonly used now. As it's commonly used, people are having different uh, devices. For instance, that, that throwing the, the ball through the tire balance, people are using it when they're, if they're drinking or socializing, if they have a beer or two, they can look if their performance starts to go, they should probably stop. They shouldn't drive. It's very accurate, as accurate as breathalyzers. I don't know how it would be in court, but it certainly can help you from not you know, hurting yourself or hurting uh, someone else. So without going into the specifics of EQ, I have a lot of people uh, from around the world that I see uh, professionally, just a large number of people utilize it. They like it. They utilize it every day. And especially when things happen, I'll give you one little side story, Jeremy, then we'll get on to things. But I had a frantic call from someone who's very, very prominent with a very prominent person. And uh, boom, they had a head injury. I said, get this thing, Jay, I don't have it. Oh, I got it on my phone. And so they just did it on that person's phone. I could see it immediately. Go, this is not good. We're gonna have to do this, this, and this. And the beautiful thing of this, uh, the, the, the idea that you can be wherever you are in the world and your doctor can be giving you that care and, and empathy uh, through utilizing this app. And let's face it, going to the doctor is not usually the highlight of people's day. It can be in, in a good situation, but basically, you know, we don't want to go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't want us to go to them if we can become autonomous and, and do things on our own. So this app can tell you when you should go into the doctor. It helps the doctor know if things are going great. Uh, are people going to utilize the test? Absolutely, because it's fun. So if I'm going to play a game on my phone, why don't, play, why don't I play a game that's going to benefit me? And people get it pretty, you know, pretty easy, but the game is fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, people, people like it. So I, I think that's a good summary of... Oh, that was, yeah, yeah, that was beautiful. So do you think because of the gamification, we know that with traumatic brain injury, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is affected. The frontal lobe's affected with people. So with gamification, it probably just drives more activation because it's fun and people, people just like to do it. So yeah, we're, we're wired that way. You know, people, you know, pleasure, pain, we like pleasure. I mean, that's the, the Epicurean 
uh, philosophical uh, reality that we have. And, you know, addiction is, uh, I mean, you can be addicted to good things uh, as well as, as bad things, but the gamification works. It takes away the stigma, yeah. but it allows your doctor to see how you're doing when you're not in the office. And how wonderful is this, right? How wonderful. Yeah. So I mean, on the sideline, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it allows us to, when people are at home, say they come in here, they do a week or whatever, they can do these testing at home and then we can see what sort of changes that are occurring. And then we can actually tweak their exercise program to keep moving on with things so people don't have to keep coming back. So if we see that, you know, your visual motor score for doing the, the King Devic portion of the test and your saccades are really slow, we might need to amp it up a little bit and get your frontal lobe doing better or give you some more saccadic training exercises. So it just allows us to be more specific to allow us to better serve patients so when they go home, they can keep moving forward and not kind of get to a plateau. We can keep checking in with them, which is beautiful. Well, you know, you're a specialist and you have a specialist clinic, so you're at a, a higher level than, than most people, uh, most, you know, healthcare uh, providers. So you're giving that really specialized, you know, brain type of treatment and your utilization of this app is going to be different than a general practitioner, but the yeah. general practitioner or a healthcare provider that is not a specialist like you can also utilize this and to do a variety of things from, you know, titrating a medication to prescribing an exercise or rest or being able to send them to someone like you. So yeah. it really is, it, it's just exciting. Everyone should know what their blood pressure is. Most people know what their cholesterol uh, is now. And, you know, type two diabetes is all over the, the place and people know what their glucose levels are. People are pretty aware of things, but what they're not aware of is, in, in my biased opinion, is the integrity of their brain, their thought, their consciousness, their abilities to enjoy the things that are wonderful in our life. And I do believe that applications such as EQ uh, are going to become more prominent and uh, available that will give us those answers. And they're beautiful answers. Everyone that I know utilizes it. And, um, and I'm talking about, you know, healthcare providers as well as their patients. It's just good. And it's almost like you're dopey if you don't. I mean, it's there. You're not pricking your finger. You don't open your mouth. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's basically free and the information is invaluable. And I think can be life changing uh, because you can, you can look at things. I had um, a beautiful family that was concerned about their dad who was having a little bit of a decline and they started using the EQ. And I, I was able to say, you know, I wouldn't really worry too much about, you know, moving him out of his place and getting an extended care because he's, he's been real stable. He's not accelerating, but you're going to find out, you know, when, when he does. And that was really great for them. And I've had other patients that all of a sudden you see them starting to go down you say, you know, this really is an indication that this is progressive. There may be some things that can be done clinically, but the reality is if they can't change that you can start to think about things that you can do to, to help them or to provide, uh, you know, care for them as we, uh, so you think, I apologize. I've got a no COVID for me, but I do have a, a little bit of a runny nose from something else. Yeah. And, and what's so cool is like the, the things that we can give patients to do at home are so simple, but they make profound changes to their brain. And it's nice to have that data from brain EQ. You know, maybe you give them some sort of complex movement or cerebellar exercise, and then you go back and you uh, recheck and then you see that you made these improvements. So I, I just think it's great. And then patients love it when you have that symptom score and providers love it too. You see that symptom score and you had, you know, 90 points and then you see it cut in half with doing some of these simple strategies. I mean, yeah. especially right now with, you know, the, the increased use of telehealth, I think with functional neurology and, you know, what we do, being able to do these assessments via Zoom 
and then have brain EQ, I mean, you can definitely get patients better from a distance. I mean, well, yeah. what they've done, the EQ people is even more than what we've talked about because they have a telemedicine portion on EQ that, that yeah. you know of. But what it does is it allows a patient to speak live with the doctor 24 seven. And it also allows them, of course, to speak directly to, to their provider. And so that you can actually see them and talk to them, they can talk to you and yeah. interact in a secure basis. The problem with like Zoom or Skype or Facebook is those things are not secure. So that if you're telling something personal about your life to your, to your provider, um, anybody can be listening. And from what we see on the news, people are listening. So uh, with these ones, with this one here, it's great. So the, the telemedicine rollout that they did is being embraced by everyone. And it's, it's really great, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we're, we're really lucky to have it. Uh, not only for, you know, concussion work, uh, which, you know, you're at the top of that game, but for just general health uh, associated with things. In other words, you know, the brain really controls your heart rate. It controls how your, how your tummy works. It controls your sexual uh, activities as well as your ability to, you know, get off the couch and go and make yourself a sandwich when you, when you need yeah. it. And it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty fantastic. Yeah. So with traumatic brain injury, one of the things that we see a lot is obviously people's eye movements are affected with the brain EQ. There are some, you know, applications or portions of it that do look at eye movements and one of them are psychotic eye movements. So I just wanted to see if you could break down a little bit about psychotic eye movements and why they're so important to assess with uh, changes in brain function. Sure. Well, you know, eye movements are, are something that has, that, that have gained a lot of clinical attention, especially over the last, you know, 50 years. But, you know, since the time of uh, Socrates and Plato, people have been looking at, you know, at people's eyes. Uh, more recently, we've been able to quantify them. In other words, we can measure them. And eye movements, uh, or you're saying saccades, they're basically fast movements. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are fast movements and there are slower movements. But these fast movements are pretty unique because they utilize uh, a large area of your brain. So that uh, eye movements in general are the only function that we have in humankind that utilizes the entire brain for everything that's coming on. And if, if you have a, you know, a lion or a tiger or a car coming from your right side, you're going to want to, you know, be able to see, you know, who's going to eat you or who's going to run yeah. you down and, or, or where the ice cream shop is. So when we look at eye movements, uh, especially the fast eye movements, they give us a window of what's happening in, in very, uh, well-known areas of the brain. So if you can imagine when you're looking at something, uh, light comes in from an object and comes into your eye, and that, that light causes activation of areas in, in your brain that passes over to the back of your brain and then forward to the front of your brain. So the entire thing, and we were always looking at something unless we're at a, a sleep. And when we're asleep, we have you know, these fast side movements coming as well when we're dreaming. So you have all this activity. So your eyes are already ready to jump to any, any uh, target that they, they do. So when we look at eye functions, the things that we'd like to look at is how long does it take you to, to make your eyes move fast to a target? And we call that a latency. And it's almost like the on your mark, get set, go you know, at the Olympics. And the guy that can get off the blocks faster can oftentimes win the race or the, the swimming thing. The guy that can leave that platform faster can oftentimes win the race. Or if you get two people that can run at the same speed, the person that can start better is usually ahead of it. And the same thing comes with humankind, that if you can uh, see a target move to it faster or initiate the movement faster, it's better. And these are one of the things that we see is impaired with concussion or the time to initiate 
uh, the movement can be slowed. So fast eye movements are really good for this. The other thing is accuracy of where we are. Everyone has been in the car with someone driving and it's like the seatbelt's not gonna save me. You're, you're riding over the white line or you're, you're too close to the curb. Ah, I'm fine. And it doesn't take much to realize that sometimes people think that they are where they are, but they're not. They're over a little bit. Or if you ever see someone that can't parallel park, all of a sudden they're hitting the curb each time or they're so far away from the curb that they're gonna get hit by other people. So knowing where a target is, is really important. And when we look at fast eye movements, uh, fast eye movements will allow you to, to generate your attention to something in space. And the, the quicker you can get there, the better. But if what you're looking at is not what you're looking at, in other words, if you see something here, my hand and your eyes think it's here, yeah. uh, doctors can look at that and say, you know, is the person actually going to the target or are they going to an area they think the target is? Or sometimes the person knows where the target is, but they can't get to there efficiently. They have to do it in, in steps. Uh, concussion is associated with the breakdown of the ability to move the eyes accurately to a target. And we've got different terms uh, for that that you, know, you are well aware of, but for the average person, it's important to realize that we have these maps of the world that uh, they don't come in the package when you're born because obviously each time you turn around, you have a different world. Or if you go into a shopping center that you haven't been into, you're not completely lost because your mind is able to generate these new maps and to uh, realize that if you were in your grocery store walking down this aisle without a problem, that aisle may not be in the same position in a new store, but you don't go banging into the zucchini counter. You know, we can, we can navigate around it. People that injure their brain do bang into the zucchini counter. They, they can't walk as well because they can't see as well or what they see is, is not appropriate. And every time their foot hits the ground, they get like a little bobblehead. They've got a, a shock that comes up and moves their head and you know, can make their eyes a little googly. Uh, for us, we don't even think of it because normally we've got the mechanisms to be able to do it. So fast eye movements, there is so much information specific to brain activity and mental health. Uh, my team published a paper last year on the physical and mental health uh, considerations of these fast eye movements that we, we call saccades. And we identified uh, different things associated with them from irritability to problems with thinking and consciousness and emotionality. Uh, and the beautiful thing is, is that once we can measure the consequences and you know all of this technical stuff of how the how the eye works uh, we can use that information as a guideline to measure the success of our treatment how good are we so it's really nice to know if you're a provider and what you're doing is not helping the person to be able to say you know what i'm doing is wrong it's not working i've got to do something else or send you to someone else that's really important and it's also important to say boy you know, we're, we're going to hit a home run with you because what we're doing is fine. Or if we're doing something that didn't work, we can make a change in that to make it work uh, without wasting time and money and effort and all of these, um, uh, and all of these things. So I don't know if that's what you wanted on no, that was my movements. I can get so technical that people would be falling asleep, I think, but that was great. Uh, that, that, that's the package. Yeah, I mean, you know, what we see clinically when people have issues with their psychotic eye movements, it always ends up, they, they start developing changes in their maps and they develop changes in posturing of their body. So it ends up being, you know, they might have a head tilt or they might have some sort of tightness in their neck that just doesn't seem to go away with manual therapy or getting adjusted or whatever. And you have to do these things that use uh, remapping of the visual system and the vestibular system to get them to integrate to allow their neck to loosen up. So that, that, that's a lot of what we, you know, see is that it changes the way that people move through their environment. And, um, 
yeah, when people have changes in their saccadic eye movements, they develop, you know, visual vertigo, they get slipping on their retina. That, I mean, that's been huge for a lot of our people. They just, they go to the supermarket, they feel like they're going to pass out and puke just from visual motion that's moving in front of them. And it's not, it's not all vestibular. So I just think it's very important that we have technologies like brain EQ and other advanced technologies like, you know, saccadometer and right eye technology to be able to, to graph these things out, get that data do your intervention actually go back and retest because a lot of people they don't do that you know as soon as they start to feel better it's like all right well see you later good luck but with these technologies we can keep following the patients throughout the year and see what kind of uh, changes that we're making and then tweak their exercises to do the best things for them to, to keep the progress going so oh, i just you know, yeah. But you mentioned that right eye. I, I'm so jazzed about that. And I wasn't for many, many years. And that's a device that allows uh, the doctor to track how the eyes move. And um, yeah. I didn't like it because it wasn't so accurate a few years ago. And I used something different, but now it's so accurate. Everyone is using it. It's really, it's really amazing, the technology. And that's not so expensive. Uh, uh, as well for practitioners, it's a little bit of a cost because it's a capital investment, but it pays itself off yeah. really, really quickly. So we have that. And now we've got, we have a pocket application that allows us to measure the changes in the size of the pupil when yeah. people are doing different things. And, and I'm presenting reflex. the reflex app. Reflex app. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing and it's cheap. Uh, and it's in your phone, but we've we've compared it to uh, you know the sixty thousand yeah. dollar pupilometer, and it's as accurate. <laughs> and it's not like this great big you know room based machine. So there are technologies, and I think that um, and I have no disclosures. You know, I don't. Uh, I'm not. You know, I'm not a principal in any of these uh, in these companies. So I'm a consumer, and if there's something better, I would use the better one. You know, that's the, that's the deal. But I think the EQ you talked about is great. The eye tracking, I think if you're going to be dealing with uh, brain injuries or neurodegeneration, you need to have that yeah. as a healthcare practitioner. And patients need to demand it uh, from the doctors that they are uh, seeing. And everyone has it now, you know, from the military, of course, right? Soldiers and sailors and people that are going to be flying airplanes into into tough situations. Everyone has it. So all the sports teams are having it. And then for autonomic testing, which is the testing that tells us about the balance of different systems that would, you know, make your heart go faster or uh, make your gut work well. And uh, all of that aspect from sexuality on done can be seen in the, in the pupil. Uh, yeah. We were, we would dream, just dream about this Dr. Spock, Star Trek, Star Trek things years ago. We have it now. And do you remember those things like, you know, uh, and I'm talking, uh, you know, I, I'm 100 years older than you are, but I, I remember the Jetsons and Star Trek and people come in and go, ee, 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 and they, they get all of this diagnostic things. It was like, wow, how funny is that? Well, we're, we're pretty well there. So um, patients are gonna demand, where are you gonna go? To somebody who's got the toys or, or the diagnostics or, or someplace else. And especially with brain injuries, um, most people, if you've been you know, active in sports, have had an x-ray of the, your head or had a CT scan or so. And if you've ever had to pay for that, depending upon your insurance or if you looked at the bill, it's big bucks, yeah. big, big bucks. You just can't get around it. If you go to a doctor, it's big, big bucks. So when you look at all, those three diagnostic tests uh, from EQ to right eye to the reflex pupilometer, it doesn't cost people an arm and a leg and gives probably more valuable information. And what does that do? It allows the, the healthcare provider to have an armamentarium to get people better faster. And if they get them better faster, that saves them money. You know, people, oftentimes go to 14 or 15 doctors before they find the right specialist and you know several hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of, of money has been expended that's terrible enough um, but the, the loss of time and autonomy and 
you know, the ability to appreciate things in your world can change as well. So yeah. we're then, really lucky to have this stuff, I think. Yeah, I mean, and then from a provider standpoint, I mean, say if you're fresh out of school and you want to go help people, I mean, you could have one room in the palm of your hand, have your iPhone or have your iPad. And next thing you know, you got your, your eye technology, you know, you buy the right eye, you know, you're checking your balance, you're, you're able to do it small. You don't have to go out and, you know, buy a $30,000 VNG and have this and have that and have that. If you take the information, you can just apply it, use those technologies, get some objectives, retest with people. So I mean, if I would have if I would have known about right eye and we would have had reflex and had brain EQ, I would have been using those right from the very beginning when I, you know, started ten years ago. Yeah, so. I don't think they had them then. I, no, I, I get amazed. Um, you know, I live in Cape Canaveral, right beside NASA, and we're having just boom, boom, boom almost every week. You know, SpaceX is popping things up. It's absolutely beautiful. We're back in the race. We've got a couple of men, you know, launched from American soil again. It's it, it's absolutely fantastic. And I have a lot of history with that, that uh, space program. So when I look at the fact that we put a man on the moon with less computer capacity than what I've got in my pocket, it blows me away what we can do. And you know, like in 1945, for instance, when uh, people were trying to measure the trajectory of bullets, the computers, basically computers were women, very smart women that were recruited that were going to university studying mathematics. The men were, were uh, you know, in combat and these brilliant women came in, a lot of them worked at Penn and they developed the math and the algorithms that led to the development of these first big, you know, main uh, mainframe computers. It was all done in people's people's noggins. Well, of course, it took a little bit longer. Uh, I remember when I was a student at university uh, computing, you know, uh, in, in physics or, you know, some problems with a slide rule. And I was pretty good at it. I was accurate, you know, like unbelievable. And I found my slide rule a little while ago and I couldn't even add on it. So what did that happen? Then you look at these guys ever see with the beads. So oh. Yeah. We're, we're, at, we're at a time right now uh, in healthcare where we have got technology that allows us to serve humankind at a better level and patients should demand that technology and the healthcare providers should have it. It's almost like, can you imagine not having a stigmomanometer? That's a blood pressure cuff in an office. Can you imagine not having that? It, it wouldn't make any sense. Can you imagine not being able to take someone's temperature. Can you imagine not being able to look at the diameter of their eyes or the speed that their eyes move or the integrity of their balance or the integrity of their consciousness? These things are all obtainable. Now, I have no idea where we're gonna be in 10 years, but it, you know, in spite of all of the, uh, the terrible things in our world right now, uh, from you name it, we've got some wonderful things and right now because of you know this pandemic and businesses and politics and all sorts of hyper emotionality people's people need their brains examined more so now i think more than ever. Yeah. than ever and i you know i know what you're doing in minnesota is is pretty stellar so uh, you're setting a very high bar for for people in, in your community and other people that come to Minnesota as a consequence of what, of what you're doing. So God bless you for that. And there's other people around the world uh, that are in your league um, so that people really can go to really great providers. And I know that general practitioners of all this ones will refer to you and to your colleagues for the things, the wonderful things that you do. So uh, this type of sharing I think is, is great and, and uh, uh, I love to go into the nitty gritty of all of these things, but I think that a flyby such as we're talking about um, makes sense. And there's, uh, there's some beauty in, in presenting things in a, in a more palatable way or, or understandable way. Yeah, perfect. 
All right. Well, thank you, Professor Carrick. I really appreciate you coming on today and talking with us and sharing this information. To It's going to go out to, obviously, providers, but also patients as well. And I think people will understand that, understand what we were talking about. And, you know, they're going to demand these technologies. And it's very important for providers to have an understanding of what's out there. So I thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Jeremy. See you later. Bye-bye.